Welcome to the Success Pick and Mix podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Raby, a professional pick and mixer. I'm a personal brand coach, a speaker, an actor, a creator, and a podcaster. I'm on a mission to help you find and create your version of success, your pick and mix of life and business on your terms, a blend that complements your personality, your goals, and your circumstances. Since 2018, I've been sharing interviews and mini episodes to help you unlock your next step, to make it real and make it happen. Round here, we dream big. We go for the ideal version. We talk about money and make moves our future selves would be proud of. This podcast is free and available for you whenever you need it. So do rate, review and subscribe for new episodes. If you want to go deeper with my support, check out my freebies house and unlock the rooms you choose. NikkiRaby.com forward slash freebies house. I also have workshops, programs and one-on-one bespoke offerings. For prices and availability, go to NikkiRaby.com. Thank you, as always, for spending some time with me and my guests. Now, on to today's episode. In today's episode, I'm talking to Anna Jacobs, who is an artist, a designer, and a mum of two. And I came across her work because a couple of months ago, I was in Soho, and I ended up in Habitat, which often happens, and I came across her pop-up shop, which is between Habitat and Heels on Tottenham Court Road. I absolutely loved her designs and I started having a chat with the staff who set up this interview. Thank you, lovely Dawn, if you're listening. And I was fascinated to hear not only, and she shares so much in this episode, about how she brought her creative life to life, but also the hurdles that she's worked through and gone round and figured out along the way. Often we're taught to be starving artists who are just in our world of creation, but actually what Anna has shown and what she talks about is how you can make this into a business, how you can have that idea in your head and use your talents and your skills to really bring it to life. If you want to join in the conversation, I would absolutely love that. Please come over to Instagram at Nikki Raby. Also, the show notes and all the links and all that good stuff is at NikkiRaby.com on the podcast page. If you're looking to bring your creative vision to life or you want to tap in and create a new business or take your career in a different direction, please let me know. Come over to my coaching page. I've started to open up some openings for the autumn. I know when the kids go back to school. So come and have a little read and see what you think. But for now, I will leave you with the episode. Oh, it's a goodie. Here it is. Hi, Anna. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Nikki. Finally. What a treat to have you. Um, Would you mind just starting by introducing yourself and what you do? Yes. Um, Well, my name is Anna Jacobs and I am now an artist and designer. So I paint original paintings and then I choose the ones that I think will work the best. And I design at the moment homewares from them. So I design I design lampshades and cushions and um, mural scale artworks for the wall. And um I have produced a company that now sells all of these on the website and I've got a little shop on Tottenham Court Road between Heels and Habitat. Oh, and it's gorgeous. I've been in it and I've kind of resisted not touching all the things. I could hear my mum going, don't touch, just look with your eyes. But, but it's just beautiful. I've, I've seen it in the flesh. And so can we go back to like, when did your creative, um, when did you know that you were creative or that you could do this or it, it came easy? Um, that's a really interesting question. I was thinking about this earlier. I think actually the first moment came when I was about 10 or 11. Um, and I, we'd started proper art lessons at school and I'd done a little bit of sketching because my art teacher said, um, it's really good as an artist to sketch every day. So I'd sketch this sort of tree and this path scene on the common where I lived and I took it in to show him and he went, wow that's really good and he's told my mum and said I think she might actually have some talent and that was the first time I just you know there was something was there and then um going up to O level he kept persuading me that I should um earn my living through being creative through art 
Wow. Um, and then I went on to uh, the next school for my A level, and that art teacher also said you really should go to art school and earn your living through art. But um, A level kind of put me off because it was so much technical drawing and drawing to exams. Yes, and that's so, usually the point where everybody discovers the pub as well. So actually <laughs> sitting down and exactly. doing all the um, sensible got- things. Exactly. So I, I ended up actually going to university and doing a couple of degrees and ending up in a girl band singing and um, and then working in theatre and then joining a cult. All through that period, I was um, doing a little bit of drawing. And then I somehow ended up um, working in a law firm. And I was asked to uh, start off and head this law firm's first marketing and business development department. It was a big firm in the city. And I only intended to stay for a year because then I wanted to leave and be creative. But of course, you know, I did got a mortgage and a nice little sports car and I ended up there for eight years and meeting somebody and having children. But oh my God, I was just getting desperate. Mm. And I got to the point on Fridays where I was just not going out to the pub with everybody, but going home, ripping off my corporate suit, getting into jeans and a T-shirt and just starting to paint and then getting up at like six or seven o'clock in the morning on Saturday and Sunday mornings and painting all weekend. And Gosh, it's it, creativity is like such a it's such a pull, isn't it? That it always yeah. like I always feel like that with acting. Sometimes I've had this love affair with it where I I love you, I hate you, I'm leaving, I'm going, and I'm doing this, and then it just like pulls me back. Go, I'm sorry, I love you, and it's just it's such a out of body experience. Sometimes it is. It's a burn and a kind of a drive. It's something that you can't really leave and it's when I felt most alive is when I'm actually actively being creative so I kind of it became very clear then that I really did have to leave I felt my kind of soul was dying in the city and that I needed to refeed it and remake it alive again so I um left when I was pregnant with my second child and um and then it you know it sort of started from there really I I had to wait a little bit till my oldest started school And I did a couple of kind of refresher courses in painting at Camberwell College of Arts and Chelsea College of Arts in painting and Central St. Martins, Um, just in all sorts of creative things, actually, photography, interior design, because I wasn't quite sure where my creative career was going to go. Mm. And in that September, when my boy started school, I kind of thought, right, now is the time for me to try and start some paid work, because what I forgot to tell you was that when I left the law firm and decided to do all of this, um, there, my children's father um, also left the relationship. And without going into too much detail, I ended up losing everything, my house, all my money and everything. Blimey. So I suddenly find myself at the age of 41 as a single parent of a baby and a toddler with literally nothing, not a penny and nowhere to live. So it was it was quite difficult to start off. Um, I did have to wait a little bit. So... Um, that September, when I decided and I kind of put that thought out into the universe, I suddenly, within the space of two weeks, got offered my first interior design job. My, um, I got offered a teaching job at Chelsea College, College of Arts on the interior design courses. And I got offered my first solo show of paintings by a little local gallery who sort of knew a little bit about my story. And I showed her a few paintings on um, email or something. And she went, right, I'm going to offer you a solo show. And that was it. Me clicked off into the creative. Wow. <laughs> the universe got the memo, hey? Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's that's brilliant. Um, I was going to say, actually, even from the law point, were, was there anyone who was trying to deter you? Because I, it's funny because I ended up going to a few corporate do's over time, um, mainly for the Prosecco, but like with friends that have invited me. And sometimes in that corporate world, creativity is not necessarily seen as a, a proper career. It's one of those like, oh, that sounds fun, but I don't really understand it. Was there anybody that sort of was in that, oh, really? You know, you're going to throw it all away, really? I have to say, no, because I was one of my jobs was also being the brand guardian and the sort of head of the style of the firm. So I was working with the more creative people in the firm anyway. And actually, I had this wonderful woman called Susan Gaffson, who is my deputy head at in the department. 
And she really encouraged me. She said, Anna, what are you doing? You're so creative. You should be painting. And um, so she really encouraged me. And a lot of other people did then, too. So it sort of gave me the confidence. And amazingly, then a couple of years after I left, she also left the law firm and has also started her own amazing um, food business, Pep and Lekka Soups and Nuts and Seeds. And so we now exchange. We're going, oh, my God, we left. and we're doing- We did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so good and actually just to have those people who maybe when you're at that point where you haven't quite you haven't quite pressed play yourself or you know yes. gone the green light then somebody else is going go on kid you can totally and it's lovely at that age and stage of life as well because yeah. we get a lot of encouragement when we're younger but to have that sort of a bit later on is is great yeah. How did you work that out logistically with a baby and a toddler and sort of shifting and changing careers? And often in those early stages, there's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of, you know, hopefully we'll have this chat and, you know, something will come from it type situations. You sort of have to be available to do the hustle and, and the chat. How how did you manage all of that? Well, I booked my children into nursery. Obviously, I waited till my oldest had started school. So I knew that was going to be a time where I was going to get free childcare for a certain amount of the day. Obviously, yeah. it was school. And I did have my daughter in nursery two or three days a week. And of course, what was great actually was the government funding where you get 15 hours of nursery once they're three, whatever it is. Brilliant. Um, it's going down to two now. So that helped a lot. And um, I, you know, with, with that government support, it made all the difference. So I basically timed everything from when they were at nursery. And actually, when you've got a really little one, sometimes I took the kids with me. I still sometimes have to bring the kids to me. Yes. To work. If I'm giving a talk at Ideal Home Show or Grand Designs Live, they're often in the audience. Sometimes they're in the shop. <laughs> But do you know what? I think it's great. And, you know, I like even my son the other day, I said, oh, what are you doing? T-? He said, what are you doing today? I said, oh, I'm doing a podcast. And he was like, oh, right. Who are you speaking to? And I was like, oh, gosh, you're two and you're listening to what mummy yeah. does. And it's so important to set that, you know, you can do what you love type message from this age. Absolutely. And I think... um my kids are certainly getting that. And I, I think particularly for my daughter, I'm really pleased that she can see that, you know, I'm working and can run my own business because there are fewer female entrepreneur role models out there, in fact. And, you know, it's it has relatively traditionally been thought of as a sort of a male, more of a male area. But we're getting more and more entrepreneur, female entrepreneur role models. But I, I'm kind of glad I can show her that I can run a business and start it all myself and do it. Yeah, for sure. How did you did you have sort of business training beforehand? How did you start to, you know, put a price on your creativity? How did that process work out for itself? Uh, I think there are two parts to that answer, actually. In terms of business training, I when I was a, when I first left university and, and me and my friends set up this girl band called the Shrinking Violets. At the same <laughs> time, <laughs> we um, went on business enterprise allowance, which was a thing then back in the early nineties, and um, you got free business training because we also this is ridiculous. We were twenty one years old. And we decided that we were going to teach gender awareness because we were right on feminist Bristol University students. Uh, We were going to teach gender awareness to teenagers in local schools in Bristol. Wow. I love it. It was a tremendous um, non-success because we we were 21-year-old girls teaching 14, 15-year-old boys about gender awareness. I lost control of a whole class when I was doing images of gender in magazines and the media. And I had all these magazines that... I thought I checked, but I asked the boys to look at and asked them to choose certain images um, that they felt they could talk about in terms of gender representation. And of course, suddenly they were all crowded around a magazine, all laughing. Their teacher came in to check how it was going. I'd lost control of the class because they'd found these models in a whole underwear, skimpy underwear. Oh, wow. Like the dream. Yes, (laughs) totally. Not what anyway. I'm digressing, but that, that's, we got some business trading. So I did have a little bit of knowledge from that. Also, I just worked at a big commercial law firm running the business development department. And, um, but so having said that, you asked particularly about though putting a price on creativity yes. that I found very difficult. And I did get it wrong at first 
because I totally yeah. underpriced and all I thought about at the beginning um, was, oh, well, this makes a profit on the cost of manufacturing. Right. And what I had not really taken into account was the cost of my time or the cost of making margins between wholesale and retail properly, which I hadn't really thought through enough. And also then building in a margin to run the rest of your business. Yes. Now I understand that you it makes you realize why products have what appears to be such a huge markup. And I know I used to go, oh, my God, but that's ridiculous. The trade price is this. These people are making so much profit. But in fact, you realize they're not making much profit at all. It might seem three times the price. Yes. But in fact, it's not because that money has to pay for so much in the background. Absolutely. And emails and, you know, your time to sort of do those logistics or have yes. those meetings with, again, those meetings that may not come to to anything, but you've got yes. to be in it to win it. Yes, exactly. Um, so, you know, it's important to think that through. But I think a really big thing also is um, that moment where you think, I have to believe that what I'm producing and that I am worth the amount I'm putting out because it will seem so expensive, you know, relatively speaking. Yes. To say that this product is worth this and I am worth this um, is a really big step. And I found that really hard at first, actually. And so I totally underpriced everything. And, and, something, and you're putting yourself out for judgment, aren't you? You know, the thing yeah. that you know about and, you know, that you've worked hard and put your heart and soul into. You know, it's not that case of just going, you know, it's a bit of, I don't know, DIY double glazing. You know, it's it's, no, self, it's part of you. It is. And that's that was another really sort of heart in the mouth moment with the creativity to because especially, you know, with art, I'm not saying especially with acting as well, anything really, anything that's creative, you are kind of exposing your soul. It's like yes. turning yourself inside out. So if that gets rejected, um, then that is fairly soul destroying. And, and I think that's one of the reasons actually why I sort of ended in quotes sort of avoided through my various careers beforehand doing the art because it was the one thing that I seemed to be sort of naturally talented at. And I thought I'd always had a dream of doing it. But I thought, God, if I do it and then it's terrible and it gets rejected, I don't didn't think I could cope with the um, the sort of destruction that would have on my self-confidence. But oh, that's before, so key. I see so many actors that are like professional networkers, but they don't actually work as an actor and earn money because it's all about talking about the dream. It's easier. Yes. Exactly. But I think that's one advantage of doing this when you're older, because by the time I got into my 40s, and also I had an imperative, I had to find a way to support my children, then in fact, I had nothing to lose. And I actually didn't care as much. And I knew I had stuff to fall back on if it didn't work. And there was other stuff that I was good at. So then then actually, you, I felt much freer, and I could really go for it and go for what really my, sort of the true expression of myself rather than having to create something that I thought would be cool or thought would be you know commercial in one way it really is um putting out what really expresses you and I think that's one of the most important things for creative businesses and careers is to be true to yourself and not try to be commercial because that's when it usually goes wrong completely did you have an idea of sort of what your aesthetic was um or did it sort of suddenly kind of come to you in a dream and you were like that's what I will do and that sort of feels like me or had you always sort of played with it over the years um, no, not at all. I wanted to be a really cool abstract artist, <laughs> somebody like conceptual, like Damien Hirst or somebody, you know, just some, something really cool. Yeah. And that's what I intended to do. And then um, what happened when I got off of my first solo show, um, I only had three weeks to paint it in the end. So it was literally practical. I had to think, well, I've got a toddler and, a you know, two small children and they're going to be crawling and running everywhere. So I can't do these big plaster <laughs> <laughs> you can't have a cow in the middle of the uh, the living room. So I thought, right, I'm going to do work on paper because that ink on paper because that dries quickly and I can store it easily because I was in suddenly a tiny flat with these two children. Um, so that was one practical thing. And then I started sort of experimenting and painting and I had such a short amount of time to do it that I fell back to what was I was best at in terms of art in school, which I was a good drawer. So um, I started drawing birds and I chose birds because at that point, even though I'd lost everything and it was all a really hard, terrible time, actually, um, I was still nonetheless 
less left with the two things that I wanted most, which was children and creativity. Oh. So despite all of that, I actually felt really happy and strong and focused and quite um, driven with purpose. So I chose flying birds because they represented that feeling. So then, and so then these flying birds appeared because I needed to draw them and I needed to do ink on watercolor paper. And um, suddenly there was the expression that I had no intention of doing whatsoever. But that's what came out. And actually it became the expression of what I wanted to do. And it, and the rest is history. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It, it's funny. It suddenly comes and then everything starts to make sense again. And then you're like, ah, okay. That's, that's being, yeah, that's great. Um, in terms of getting your brand out there, I feel like sometimes my coaching clients say, but hasn't there been another, not necessarily a cushion company, but hasn't somebody done something similar like this? How did you sort of trust that, what you was doing, what you were doing was different and that your USP was enough for you to really fly, if you'll um, pardon the pun, with it? Well, I tested it little bit by little bit and gradually built up. So the first thing I did really with these designs was I showed at my local open house, artist's open house, which is in Dulwich. And for that, there was no risk because um, I didn't have to pay for the venue um, it's local people. I could invite friends and family. And I just produced a few samples, really just to test the reaction, because I didn't have to invest much in that at all. And then I could see whether people liked it. So because also members of the public came and, you know, I was really prepared to shift things or, you know, try here and there. And actually, it was that that I got such a great response. And I had two key people who saw it. One um, had been working at Living Etc., magazine and one um had been working at habitat and they both happened to come and see the show oh, happy both, days the universe comes out to play again yes and they said oh my god these this is with this is really exciting what you're doing these are fresh new designs this is really great and they both said we want to help you in any way we can and then um i submitted to the new talent section at top draw at olympia and they, I got selected for that. And so I got a little bit of help going to because then you get a good discount being selected for new talent. So then I showed at a trade show about six months later. I put, was pushing it hard and fast, I have to say, because I need to earn money. Yeah. And that was then another endorsement because, again, that was quite nerve wracking because then it's professional buyers and big shops. Yes. And it's serious. And then it's kind of real, isn't it? It's very real. And everybody said to me, look, on your first trade show, don't worry, you most people won't sell anything on their first trade show and you'll be lucky if you get one sale and then, you know, people come back to see you on the second. And if you're there at the third trade show, then they'll buy from you. But on that first trade show, I, I had 15 retailers buying from me. Wow. <laughs> and so then I just thought, OK, this is it. This is this actually is something that's going to work. And it just so happened I painted these bright, shocking pink flamingos before the flamingo trend had happened at all. And I, I thought it was really uncool, all my bright colours and tropical prints and things. And it, it so happened, I had no idea that it was the at the very front of that wave. It was just starting the whole tropical flamingo thing. Oh, so that, I love that pink colour. It's gorgeous. It's on trend. So, you know, it was a lot of luck and a lot of, um, you know, being in the right time at the right place. And just going for it, basically. Just Yes. Yeah, I think we can sometimes all sit back and kind of hope and pray and think about it and walk around the park with it. But sometimes you actually just have to send the email. Yes. Yes, exactly. And and just do it, as, as the Nike advert says. <laughs> yes, so true. So where do you want to be in sort of five years, I guess? And sort of where do you want to take it? Do you, do you know? Um, yes, I do know. I want to make it into a really um, a big, well-established global brand that is very much about um, producing work rather like I am now that um, supports well-being in our lives. So it's well-being through colour and design, because I do feel that if we live in a more beautiful environment, then it does make our lives better. It improves our um, self-confidence improves our happiness and when you're feeling more confident and happy and you're getting all those wonderful benefits of color and visual stimulation yes. then actually you can do better in life and I know for myself 
when I've been really destitute, living in really horrible places, it it supports depression and it's it it doesn't help you move forward and get going. But I think if there is some way where we can, um, you know, that I can submit through charitable things and um, various um, collaborations and things also to support in some ways people who don't have access to all of this stuff to actually help people live in a, in a more beautiful environment. That's one aspect of it. And then I also want to have a large concept store. And my little shop between Habitat and Heels is just a tiny little beginning. <laughs> but a large concept store that's a creative studio store, really, where I have my workshop where I'm painting and making. But also that's where we people come and buy things and they can explore colour and explore the effects that colour have on us in terms of our well-being and in our homes. And you can just explore like that and then either buy in the store or then just go and buy online. So it's a really active, creative space. I just love the accessibility of that because I think sometimes with art or whatever, it, again, it might not be that thing that's like acting is taken seriously, but actually it it can be. And most people, even though they say, oh, I can't draw or I can't do, I can't sing, yeah. I'm not good at standing in front of people or whatever it is. Mostly those things can be learned. And yeah, I'm not saying that I'm going to be Picasso tomorrow <laughs> by any means, but I can get better than I am today, perhaps. No, absolutely. And so and I, I think it's really, every, people are more and more interested in the actual making and crafting process now. And it's yes. fascinating to watch people do that. So in fact, on that basis, next week or maybe the week after, I'm actually going to start drawing and painting outside my shop um, on Tottenham Court Road between Habitat and Heels. Um, because I've, I've sold all my original paintings now. So I've got to paint more and I've got to produce a whole load of new designs for October to launch in a little festival of light at Heels. Mm-hmm. So... I've really got to do some serious things. <laughs> You're like, oh no, oh goodness, this has got to happen now. Brilliant. <laughs> so if people want to come and see you, they should come to the shop, but also um, your website. Can you just remind yes. us of that if people are just listening? My website is www.annajacobsart, which is A-R-T dot com. If you can't remember that, then just go to annajacobs.london. Brilliant. And we will um, add everything into the show notes as well so so people can come and see. But, oh, Anna, you're so inspiring and I just love your story. And for me, just creating this podcast to get to speak to amazing creative women every day, it's just such a treat. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I am very honoured that I've been able to speak to you and it is a total treat. And um, good luck with all the next ones. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you haven't already, feel free to rate, review and subscribe for all the brand new episodes. If you want to go deeper with my support, check out my freebies house and unlock the rooms you choose. NikkiRaby.com forward slash freebies house. I also have workshops, programs and one-on-one bespoke offerings. For prices, availability or just to have a chat with me, go to NikkiRaby.com. Thank you as always for spending some time with me and my guests and I'll see you next time.